Bradley Wiggins continues to the cheers of the crowd. This is going to go down whatever time he does. is one of the most memorable moments of his career. He rides for a French team, but he's a Londoner as he rides towards the line now. And look at this, 9.03. It's going to be close, but he's not going to nail Cloden, I'm afraid to say, as it ticks by now. But Wiggins is still looking at second place, the time of George Hincapi. This is still going to be an exceptional time by Bradley Wiggins. Make no mistake about that. Where is the line? He hits it, but he goes to third. A fraction of a second behind George Hincapi. No home win for Bradley then, and with all the riders either finished or out on the course, there was only one man with the pedigree to beat Andreas Clurden's time. The world time trial champion Fabian Cancellara was setting new best marks at the checkpoints. Well, Cancellara sitting up, he's almost putting that. the motorbikes into difficulty. They can't get around these corners as fast as he can, Phil. They don't realise how this fast this man is going. That case coming right up behind, that was the O'Grady bend, but now he's sprinting after those bikes who almost got caught by this flyer from Switzerland. He's going to beat the time, he's going to go inside, he's going to go inside eight minutes. He is going to go inside of nine minutes nine when it minutes, comes to I the finish line. He's excited. inside of eight minutes at one kilometre to go, Phil. I think we are looking at eight minutes and 55 seconds when this man comes up to the finish line, and he doesn't look like a man who is going to slow down at all. He's looking now at the sweeping bend right in front of him, right in front of Buckingham Palace. Cadell Evans could probably feel his breath on his neck. Well, Cadell Evans, another man looking to the future, and not to the prologue, but that's a great ride from Cadell. It's overshadowed. Look at the distance, the far distance of the world champion of the time trial. The man who has won the prologue before in Belgium doesn't seem to like winning them in France because now he's going to win this one in London as he rides on the straight. This has been a ride to save your life. Cancellara has put the icing on the cake for a brilliant London organisation today as he spins towards the line to beat the nine-minute barrier. He beat it, he annihilated eight minutes and 50 seconds. No one left can do that. Today, the whole world looking on me. And a beautiful crowd, it's a lovely day, and the Tour de France is saying its farewells to England in magnificent style here. While the lonely figure of Cavendish will come in by himself, this field has gone through the barriers and it is looking for a lead out of one kilometre from the finish now. It may well be Eric Zabel who will take on Tom Bone, and I still can't see Robbie McEwen from the helicopter, but there is a jersey down there from his team. Now, as we see them come off this banner here, and our cameras have had to move away from us, but that looks as though Zabel is not far away. Zabel is lined up in third place here. Bonin is in fourth place. Bernati is in fifth place. The big sprinters and they're waiting for the move and Foster is in there as well now. Watch out for Hunter who's also going to have a dig for Barlow World. Robbie Hunter as he wobbles all over the road now and they're chasing him down as best they can but this is going to be a win for Robbie Hunter or is it? The South African rider is trying to take them to the line here. This will be a tremendous surprise. A wild card team for victory as Hunter grits his teeth as he gone to soon. Robbie Hunter, Robbie McEwen is coming. McEwen the acceleration on the middle of the picture. The man off the back is going to win. Robbie McEwen, the man from nowhere. Welcome home. Unbelievable. I don't know how on earth does that happen. Robbie McEwen's 12th stage win in the Tour and one of the most impressive as Robbie was happy to tell us himself. But we managed to come back and after that I thought, well, you know, my teammates have put in this amount of effort to get me back. I've got nothing to lose now, i just got to do my best. And on a finish like this, it goes uphill. Um, being what you'd probably call a lightweight, um, I've got that acceleration. And, uh, you know, that gives me an advantage when I, when I do go. And then it's a matter of holding on to that advantage. And, um, you know, I felt very good in the sprint. I felt like I was dying, but, I mean, everybody was. It was a, it was a very hard stage, in fact. The banner. It is going to be desperately close. There is the catch about to happen. It has all happened just inside. Three kilometres to go. Somehow, they've timed it to perfection. Look over your shoulders, boys. Well done, all three of you. But now get out of the way, because the train is about to mow you down as Liquigas also leads the charge. On the far right now is Quickstep. Now, will anybody try the luck? Well, if Tom Bonham wants to win this race here this afternoon as they can negotiate that nasty little bend here, that's the bend at three kilometres to go I told you about. It's fairly straight now as we line up towards the finish line. This is the circular road around Ghent. They've got that final little kick at 750 metres to go, but for Tom Bonham to win, he needs to be 
launched into action. They call him Torpedo Tom here in Belgium, and he will be right at the end of all of his teammates. But floating in his slipstream, you can be absolutely certain there'll be a little man from Australia, the man in the green jersey, who for the moment we still can't see, and that is Robbie McEwen. And trying to get on tears, Mark Cavendish team of Great Britain. They're the riders in the move, and the blue jerseys are the jerseys of Tom Bonham. This is going to be death strip finish. These are the first time... Oh, there's been a terrible pile-up there. A massive pile-up on the road. The yellow jersey has gone. He will get the same time because of the international regulations. They will not lose time, but how many are down and who has gone down? Well, I'm not sure who the first man was to go down there, but went very hard. It looks as if there's a green jersey gone down there as well. It's not very often you see Robbie McEwen. That could be a rider from Credit Agricole. That's a little bit of chaos inside the last three well, cases. T-Mobile are now in has control. This, well, has in fact Mark Cavendish gone down? There was somebody in T-Mobile on the right of the road. He's not here with his lead-out men. As they all come up towards the line now, it is a question of who's left in the group. But I think McEwen is in the group. This is the chaos at the two-kilometre point now all of these riders will be given the same time it's only a question of how many are hurt and is Mark Cavendish in there as well well this is what happens when the bunt goes down at about two kilometers to go this is absolute chaos as you said now at the front you can see the blue jerseys of team Quickstep. I can just see the white helmet there of Tom Boone and he's lying there in fourth place Robbie McEwen is sitting right on the back of this group in his green jersey so once again McEwen has avoided the pilots but he's an awful long way down the line here this is a perfect lead out now for the quick step team Bowman is the fourth man his head bowed there he knows the finish above all Oscar Ferrer kicks in on the left in the brown colors he looks across at Zorba and there's a lot of people dodging around now the launch for the line this has got to be a win for Bowman now because he knows the finish it kicks up violently he's got to time it to absolute perfection Robbie Hunter is in there as well as the flag of fathers flies high they race for the top of the hill this is Gert Stegman's leading out now as he makes it move on the left Bowman is in his slipstream. McCure makes progress, but he's too far back. He's alongside Hunter, as now coming up to the line. This is the move by Bonin, but still kicking on the right is Gerd Stegmans as they come to the line. Well, Bonin salutes, but I've got a feeling Stegmans has won the day. Well, Stegmans was the lead-out man there. You can hear the crowd. The crowd have all of a sudden just heard who's won the stage. They're all Belgians out there at the moment. They will be absolutely enthralled by the fact that their big man has got the victory, but it wasn't the big man they were waiting for. In fact, it was Tom Boone and they all thought would win, but it was definitely Stegmans there who got his hand in the air. Of course, well out of it back at the two-kilometre mark was the majority of the field, including for the second day running, Mark Cavendish. The question is, what caused the crash that brought some of them down and held the rest up? Chris Boardman's been looking at the helicopter evidence. Chris? Well, I've had a really good look at the helicopter footage now, and I actually think it was Eric Zabel who pulled his foot out, something he's done in the past, overlapping a wheel, veered to the right, brought a liquid gas rider down right in front of Mark Cavendish, and the whole chain reaction started from there. Now, among the victims of the crash that either brought down or held up the majority of the field was the yellow jersey. Well, not so much the jersey, which looked fine, but the man wearing it. Fabian Cancellara rolled in, holding his arm and looking to be in some discomfort. The only way the main field are going to catch him if those guys start playing that tactical manoeuvring of slowing down and waiting to see if they can save a little bit of energy on the charge of the line because the main field won't. Willems has gone again. It was 20 seconds at two kilometers to go. Willems has got the strength, but he can't get rid of the Frenchman. They are like sandbags to him. He wants to throw them out and float to victory. Well, if I'll tell you what, if Stefan Auger wins this stage, he only has to win by 18 seconds and he'll be the yellow jersey of the the race as well and we're getting very close to the finish now we're not there yet we're racing down through the banks of the river Seine with Compiègne we swing away it might be against the riders it is slightly uphill over the cobblestones couple of nasty corners as we come up towards the finish line they're starting to panic now they're looking over their shoulders they know the main field will not give up there's the main field it's looking at about 200 meters they're not too far now they're going to start to line up they're not far away from the flam rouge and then the long straight to the finish line this is very dangerous for these guys but it's more dangerous for the men behind there's the kite and these are the peloton here they're on the cobblestones they may totally have misjudged this today a brilliant move those two riders straight 
Everton by two more. If they win, they've been in the lead for 231 kilometers, and the peloton pass under the Flamme Rouge. We will quickly switch to the leaders. Well, you can see now on the front, Lamprey, everyone's panicking that made the leading group of four riders. They've absolutely started to mess around. Somebody now has to take the responsibility, but Fabian Cancellara has I do not front. believe this. The strength of the race leader has gone after them himself to save his yellow jersey from Auger. And Cancellara has taken off. There's confusion behind. Quick steps at when is Tom Bowler going to make his move? Is Mark Cavendish right on the front there? These boys, Vogan, he looks over, they're going to give it to the yellow jersey. This is going to be a huge present. What a ride by Cancellara. He suddenly sensed he could win the stage of absolutely nowhere. They've wiped them out on the line of the stage of the Tour de France. 400 metres, 300 metres. Cancellara, the strong man of the time trial, has ridden them off his wheel. He is going to come up to the line here now. The move behind as Robbie McEwen kicks. McEwen and Robbie Hunter. Hunter now bowling on the left. Cancellara zarbles on Cancellara's wheel. And he looks as though we've got Cancellara, Zabel on the line, Napolitano, Bonin. They all got beaten by the yellow jersey. That'll serve him right. Three kilometres to go now. A leaky gas want Filippo Pizzato to come through, or maybe Quinziato. Those are the two fast men for that team. But look out too for Geraint Thomas from Cardiff because he is the rider who is recharged with the responsibility of finding Degano and also Robbie Hunter. And Hunter's showing he's sprinting very, very well. And Barla World are here and seriously here. They have all those riders with the yellow flashes on the red jerseys. This could be a good result for the South African boys. Well, Enrico Degano's in there with Geraint Thomas, is in there with Robbie Hunter. Now look on the left hand side, uh, Ventoso moving up there with his man from Sonier Duval, but still. Still no appearance at the front of the blue train of Tom Bonin. Nobody yet has got control. They're all waiting. They all know you've got to wait till the last possible moment. Now you can see an organization now, Milram, getting themselves over on the right hand side. They're looking after their man, Eric Zabel. He may well have just turned 37 years of age, but he won't give up. He's been consistent since the start of the tour. This is a dangerous moment. There's a loss of impetus at the front end of the main field. They've switched out. They're now toming themselves down. Wegman has decided to go to the front. He's not looking after himself, he's thinking about his man. Two kilometers to go, hands are coming off the handlebars now. Boonen's men are still in the wings waiting. Boonen's a little bit too far to the front, in fact, he doesn't have any lead out men. Two kilometers to go, Fabian Wegman swung off, he's done his bit for the team, but his team weren't behind him. He looks and wonders where they are now, and it's now been passed control to T-Mobile, and Mark Cavendish's team have hit the front. They may be there a little bit early, Bonus team, and Stegman's coming up on the left of the field here now. And also, we've got the team here, and that looks very much like we might have Geraint Thomas on the front as he tries to drive them through here. Here comes the run by Lamprey now, as they try to bring the Napolitano through. This is a first big sprint of the Tour, and it is a free-for-all. Well, Julian Dean is right in there as well, in the black and white. You can be absolutely certain right on his wheel is going to be Tor Hushoff. 1,000 metres to go. There is the Flamme Rouge. Quick step have got control right now. They're on the front, but where's Tom Boone? And he's not on the wheel of his teammates. There's a line of Milram. They're looking after Zabel. There's a lot of pink jerseys in there for T-Mobile. There's a little bit of a switch right now. They're going to start to line up for the finish line. They're looking now at about five. 150 metres to go, Gerolsteiner pulls off, still quick step in control. Well, watch for this little switch at 250 metres, it might disrupt the move here now. And still Robbie McEwen is not there, so I can see Robbie Hunter trying to get through, but they're still not going to make a big spin, and Julian Dean's on the front now. Dean has found his man, Tor Hushoff. Dean, the champion of New Zealand, Hunter coming on Dean's wheel. Hushoff opens the sprint in the centre now. Where Foster trying to get through on the right here, as now Tor Hushoff hits the line at last. Tor Hushoff vaulted himself into third place place overall courtesy of a fine sprint win it Korov now the white helmet there giving away that Alexander Vinokurov has gone down now how did this accident happen there is the bike his teammate up alongside him immediately there now this can happen at any time during the tour 191 that is the bicycle of Alexander Vinokurov with the field ahead of him really beginning to wind up the pace Vinokurov had crashed at the worst possible time his team knew it, and soon he had six teammates back with him. The problem was that he was clearly stronger than any of them, and within minutes, the Kazakh train was a lone locomotive.
The place to make up time was on the final descent into Otom, but it was a dangerous one, which saw Fabian Cancellara take the yellow jersey off-road momentarily as he misjudged a corner. Approaching the finish, the pre-race favourite Vinokurov was over a minute down. Well, I have a feeling now that Vinokurov is fourth in line here, will concede some seconds today, but he hasn't conceded any like it looked like he was going to lose a couple of minutes at one stage. He's come back to the front, he's going to try and knock off every second he can. He is now under the two to go, as the race, these are the leaders under the two to go, I'm sorry. That's about 1.3 miles from the finish. Well, there you can see uh, Vinokurov is a kilometre behind the front end of the main field, but at speeds like this, that is actually less than the one-minute mark. You can see the organisation, somebody moving to the front there, trying to create a big surprise. That's a late-minute burst for the line, and on a day like this, you can surprise anybody. Sonia Duval coming across there, that's David Miller, I think, the big, tall, lanky man from Scotland. Well, if it is Miller, this is a sort of climb, but he's got it's an awful long way to the finish here. He may have gone too soon. Boy Telecom have replaced Laurent Lefebvre at the front, and I can't see this rider's face at the moment in the darkness of the pictures. The field are coming up behind it. This is Miller, and it looks like him. He has got to wait just a little bit because he's too far from the line. Well, the sprinters now have got to get their men on the front and get this organised, but Miller has now gone around that corner. Vinokurov, we keep going back to see where he is. He's around about 50 seconds in arrears. He's trying to save his Tour de France with this ride. He won't have any friends at all in that group. He has to take his own responsibility. He has to ride to the finish line and keep going. He's inside of two kilometres to go. Well, we're waiting for the leaders to reach one, so Vinokurov, and they're about there, so he is holding them at around about 50 seconds. Vinokurov, and I think he's going to destined to lose that now. These two riders are still clear, and it looks as though it... I don't think that's Miller, you know, but it could be. As he gets into the front, it looks as though he hasn't had a shave this morning. And the rider who's got onto his back wheel there, I think, is Tony Jeslin. And it doesn't matter because the Lamprey are closing in. Lamprey are there, they're locked in, there's a line of riders right behind them. George Hincap, he's disappeared from the front end of the main field. Cadell Evans is not far away from the front end of this group. He's up there in about fifth or sixth. The yellow jersey is safely in that main field here as they line themselves up for the line. 400 metres to go. And Eric Zorbel has put himself in a brilliant position. Centre picture and dodging, and Freire's on his shoulder. This is a battle of the sprinters now. Zorbel is out of it. Freire is as he races up to the line. Eric Freire, Hinkap, he's going after them. And also there is Napolitano, but the man who has won on the line, Pizzato, Filippo Pizzato, has taken it. Well, he was on the lips of a lot of people this morning, but he produced one incredible finish to win that. Zorbel had it right, Freire had it right, but right through the middle, Pippo Pozzato said at the start of the day here, Phil, I'm going for this, this is my stage. It's not very often a rider can pick a stage, predict that he's going to win and come up with the victory. Oscar Freire right up there as well, but here is the arrival of Alexander Vinokurov's group with Tom Bonin. As he tries now himself to fight all the way to line, the minutes gone by, he's left himself a handicap for the remaining two weeks and a bit of the Tour de France. Vinokurov will have to fight his way through the Alps now and get his own back when he can because he's had a rather unlucky ending to the day here as he comes up to the line, he brings the peloton home a minute and 20 seconds or so. There's the chaos, there's nobody got control, there's a rider at the front from Team Milram now trying to stretch it out, but I have never seen charging into the line at 1.8 kilometres to go such a bunched up front end to a sprint so far in this tour. There is no organisation, Cavendish is just off on the left to our picture, his teammate dropped right out of it, but look at an early move there, Zarbel wants to move up, his two teammates here are saying just wind it up, go, 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 how much power have they got left. Zabel's a little bit too far to the front now, he's in fourth position at still outside of the one kilometre mark, right on his wheel though is Oscar Freire, there's another move coming up, another rider from Milram wants to try and control the pack if they can, Boonen is stuck in the middle there, he's got no teammates at all around him, he's looking for a way out, he feels at this point a little bit panicked because he's got that boxed in feeling. Well, underneath the trees they go, Hushoft is dead centre and just behind at the moment, Freire is off to the right, 
as they come into the home straight now. They're going to have the launch for the finish. Flesh has moved off the front. Milram is still holding. Bone has got a good wheel here, but it's going to be a hard run for the line now as Johan Van Summen looks for Robbie. Where are you, Robbie? He says. McEwen is about eight, nine men back here now as the wind up goes for the finish. Stegman is launching the attack for the line and also leading up there is Marcus Berg out, the big boy in T Mobile now. Now it's Julian Dean. Are they right? Is Julian Dean going to finish this off for New Zealand? He's got the front again, but he's gone too soon to the front. But this is a massive power result as Marcus Berghout goes for the line now. Who is going to take the sprint here? Hunter is coming through. Hunter's made a dive for the line of Robert Foster as they come to the line. Bowden is now coming. This is an absolute free-for-all and Foster is making the final throws. But in a final dig for the line now, as this looks like it's Ponen right on the line, and he's made it at last. Well, he was looking for that one, Philip. He's going all over the place, left and right through the middle. He wanted to come out. Let's just have a look at that one more time. At Gerald Steiner were the boys who really sorted it out. Bonin is down there in fifth place. All of a sudden, he starts to move up. The lead-out man for Forster moves across, forcing Tom Bonin to go right the way round the outside. He comes back in to replace himself in the middle. He's got Oscar Freire challenging him there but today Tom Bonin had the bit between his teeth he wanted this win he wanted to get his green jersey back with pride and look at Eric Zabel he's still right up there in second or third position but Tom got the win that he's been looking for for a couple of days this is life at the back of the peloton and we've only just started the climb here of the Col de la Colombia gone from the group is Fabian Cancellara he waved at the cameras and said au revoir for the moment uh, we haven't seen Mark Cavendish, but he got back after he was dropped early on, and uh, his team manager said he was feeling a lot stronger. Uh, but I think uh, he w common sense will say he will drop out of this big peloton as we go higher up the mountain. We're climbing now from an elevation of over 3,000 feet. Well, uh, the numbers of riders in this group have already been reduced quite dramatically. Uh, Sad to see Fabian Cancellara disappear from the group, Phil, but at least at the end of the day, he gave us a great first week of racing. This is a move now coming off the front from Team Barlow World. No main reaction at the front end of the group. You can see over to the right-hand side that Rabobank are doing a great job, and they are probably looking after Michael Rasmussen and Denny Menshov. All of the main contenders, like Levi Leipheimer and the rest of the men who think they can win this race after three weeks, are still sitting in the main field because I think, Phil, they realise how difficult this climb is going to be in the last eight kilometres. And also a huge day tomorrow here as the rider from Barlow World, the South African team. There's only one South African actually on it, that is Robbie Hunter. But even so, this is a South African team, the first time ever in the Tour de France. They've got a wild card entry and they've been quite prominent, especially with the huge efforts of Hunter. Well, this is the front of the race now. We're looking at uh, Dmitry Fofanov on the left-hand side. On his wheel is uh, Gerdeman. Gerdeman, in fact, uh, I thought would be the weakest rider when it came up to here, but in the past he's been tipped for great stardom, this young man. A very young T-Mobile squad brought into the Tour de France this year, uh, mainly in support of Michael Rogers. Michael Rogers is still locked at the front end of the main field. He, too, is a rider who's got to show us what he's got in those legs today. If he's going to be a serious challenger to win this bike race after three weeks, I don't think anybody expected this. But the average speed, Phil, on this climb is uh, hovering out at about 15 kilometres an hour. That gives you just an indication of how difficult this slope is. Well, with 14 kilometres to go, the lead is five minutes. If they keep it up, they might go over the top with a two-minute advantage. That's what that graphic is meant to us for, but it's a very complicated one. Computers uh, can only work on speeds at the moment, of course. The body has another idea. 25 uh, kilometres to the summit. Fofanov has made an early move here. Obviously, I'm a bit surprised they pushed on quite so early. I thought that they would have actually uh, kept going as uh, these two riders are moving clear of the field. I thought they would have waited for those two Spanish guys, but no. Now, this is a sign you don't want to see. 25 kilometres but at least that's, the, that's where the finishing line is waiting for them. Well, they've still got a long way to go to the summit. Uh, once they get to the summit, they've got 14 and a half kilometres to plunge down through the Chinayon, through the Grand Bonnard before they get down to the finishing line. And of those 14 kilometres, 10 of them are completely downhill at breakneck speeds. And it's the man who goes downhill the fastest this afternoon may well come up with the win. We're looking at about 10 kilometres still to get to the summit of the climb. 
And Rabobank are now driving on the front. The right-hand rider is Michael Bogart as they try. And David Miller peeping into the picture on the left here. David Miller might be on a great Tour de France this year. He's had a good, solid first week. Well, I tell you what, Fabian Cancellara has disappeared from the group. If Andreas Cloden and Filippo Pozzato disappear from the group and David Miller can stay in contact, he will be the new leader of this bike race this afternoon. If George Hincapie, your tip for the day, doesn't cross the line in first place and get the time bonus, because in that case, George Hincapie would be the new leader. It is so difficult to try and figure out who's going to lead this race this afternoon. Well, maybe the next 14 kilometres will give us a uh, good indication here. The 15 riders are split up. Our cameras are committed all over the Colombia, so we can't show you everything, but we can show you now the face here of Dmitry Fofanov alongside him, Linus Gerdeman of T-Mobile and Credit Agricole. 9.94 kilometres still to go to the top of this climb. They have attacked right from the bottom. They've blown the 15 men away, and they're planning on making it to the top without any people up there with them. Well, Gerdemans of these two riders is the best rider in the overall classification. He started the day just 58 seconds in arrears, so he also is looking at the possibility of a yellow jersey at the end of the day. Rabobank, on the other hand, are thinking long-term here. They're thinking of their man, Denny Menshoff. Menshoff has got a very good chance of winning the Tour de France this year. He's a serious contender, and I think that is why they've now decided to take control of the front end of the main field. And, of course, they'll be looking after the man they call Chicken Legs as well, who is in fourth place there, Michael Rasmussen. Rasmussen has already won the King of the Mountains title on two occasions, and I think he'd like to make it title number three this year. Quite a, a compact little peloton which he's forming there, looking from the helicopters. Not a lot of riders at all. Norwegian flag flying, and I noticed that Vinokurov is just about passed over to the left of our picture. Not light, uh, there he is in the light jersey. He's in the centre of that group and looking as though he's not having any problems here. So this is becoming a very select peloton on the lower slopes of the Colombia. Not a big one at all, but Rabobank are taking control. They must fancy Denny Menchoff today, as well as Rasmussen. Oh, what about Thomas Decker? Because it's Thomas Decker over there on the left-hand side as well, getting his first taste of the Tour of Tour de France. Yes, a young man who could run out the winner today. Such an aggressive young rider. He won the Tour of Romandy this year, and he won the Tirano Adriatico last year. He's only 22. Well, everybody seems to be young on T-Mobile. This rider is not 25 until September. Linus Gerdeman. He's decided, he had a lot of confidence there, to split up that group straight away. Fofanov, who's never won a race apart from his uh, hometown national championships, he was immediately on his back wheel. Well, they're actually swapping turns here at the moment. They've reached a, a slightly flatter part of the climb, so that's why they're picking up the pace. They're keeping it nice and high. It really is in the last eight kilometres that this climb starts to dig in. If you just look at the gears that those riders are in, they're riding this part of the climb on the large chain ring. That's an indication that it's not that steep. It's probably running out at about 5% the gradient. They're 25 seconds over the two chasers, the two Spanish riders, uh, Jose Ivan Gutierrez and David de la Fuente, and still a massive four minutes back to the main field. A nice study in the face here, though, Linus Gerdeman. Doesn't look under any pressure. He's riding a terrific race just now, as he's willing to work. It's hard to work on a mountain, but the, as Paul says, it's a false flat here just at the moment. About eight kilometres to the top. And uh, we're hearing four minutes coming over the radio back to the main field. So they're continuing to move closer, but they're not getting close enough. They could get over the top here with a couple of minutes. They could very easily get over the summit of the Col de la Colombier. The top of the Col de la Colombier now is inside of eight kilometres for these riders, the two lead riders. A little bit further back, we're looking at four and a half minutes to the main field. Uh, Shutsu, the rider from Team Barlow World, who nicked off the front, is actually at four minutes. Christophe Moreau is over there on the left-hand side for France, and there's Michael Rogers in the middle there for Team Mobile, looking very comfortable at the front end of the pack. Michael Rogers also looking good for Australia today. Into the uh, advertising barriers here. Rabobank are well represented, so they've got a plan for today at 25 kilometres to go. Michael Rogers has ridden a very quiet race, but we've all had a feeling he's holding on to some good form here. He's dead centre in the Mauve jersey. 
little bit handicapped by the fact one of his young teammates is setting the pace at the front, so he can't damage that because he might have a race leader on the team by the end of it. And AG2R also looking very, very strongly. This is a Jose Luis Arrieta at the back. But that uh, peloton, Paul, to me is down to about, what, 35? There are not very many riders left in this big peloton, and there will still be a few more get uh, nailed off the back. Just also slipping back Maxim Iglinski there for Team Astana. He's the national champion of Kazakhstan. That's what it looks like a little bit further up the road, and I'll tell you one thing, uh, we may well be seeing the lead in this race switch across to T-Mobile at the end of the day, because if Gerdeman and Fofanov go over the top with the advantage they've got at the moment, Phil, Gerdeman is the best rider of the two in the overall classification, and that is something that I don't think anybody would have predicted this morning. Absolutely not, and uh, Gerdeman was the one that got in the breakaway, described as a lucky one by his team manager. He didn't mean it lucky, lucky, though, he meant that... A lot of riders attacked, but he got, got in the one that got away. Gutierrez at Landaluz and at De La Fuente. That's the chase group. For some reason, the Spanish boys allowed these two, a Kazakh and, um, and a German, to get away from them, which I can't really understand why, but they're still holding them off. As we're going to see large crowds now all the way up the Col de la Colombia. And these two are working well together. This is the met what's left of the peloton. And David Miller has survived so far, although he's dropped away from our view at the moment, as uh, the third rider here is uh, Thomas De Decker. Thomas of the, Decker. Uh, Thomas Decker. There is George Hincapie in the centre with the stripes on. Champion, and he's riding next to Levi Leipheimer, his teammate, keeping an eye on him. Still in this group as well, I noticed 191, that's Alexander Vinokurov. So despite the fact that a lot of riders have been left behind by the main field here this afternoon, Alexander Vinokurov, Phil, is still very much in contact. That's a good sign, he's feeling a lot better. We were worried yesterday when he drew his hand across his throat, I thought he was saying, I've had it. Well, not so at yet, 20.7 kilometres from the finish as we now continue to climb a quite a tempo up the Col de la Colombia. They won't keep this tempo up for long without cracking the whole field because those two boys up front are holding off the pack here. They're climbing at the same speed as the peloton. Here they are, side by side, but very soon this climb will get tough. It's about to get very difficult indeed. Uh, looks like the chasers now are down to two riders. Uh, Lander losing the orange jersey, yellow jersey. At the back there is uh, David de la Fuente. I think somehow or another, Jose Ivan Gutierrez has now been left behind. So it's two men being chased by two men, and the rest of that 15-man group, Phil, have been pretty much spread over the slopes of this mountain. There's Gutierrez now. Yes, he's really cracked big time and decided to quickly get into a slower rhythm there. Wise decision. He's been dropped. He was the man that caused all the problems right at the start as well. It's funny, isn't it? At the bottom, he was the man launching the attack, and now here he is in trouble. Just over 20 kilometres. The banner won't be too far away for these two men now. Something of a surprise. Gerdeman, is he climbing to yellow in his first Tour de France? This could be amazing, because it doesn't look like the man is under any pressure at all here. Terrific climbing rhythm he has got. Just over five kilometres to go to the Col de Colombia. They are climbing this mountain so quickly at the moment. At the moment, but in fact, they're just reaching the slightly steeper part and they've turned to the smaller gears. This climb now, Phil, is starting to bite in dramatically. We're just on the five, uh, five and a half kilometres from the top of the climb as Gerdeman has tried an acceleration. This is a slightly steeper section. What is wrong with this guy, Paul? He doesn't want to be with anybody on the Columbia. Well, he was riding up alongside Fofanov to see whether or not Fofanov had the legs to stay with him, and that's why he was riding alongside him. He was trying to feel how the Kazakhstan rider was going. And all of a sudden, he thought, this guy's not strong enough to stay with me anymore. I'm off. I'm going to take this race by storm. He's got inside of 20 kilometres to go, but he's still got himself a four minutes advantage over the front end of the main field. In fact, the peloton have dropped back to five minutes. You know, Gerdeman has been a professional, Phil, since 2005. He's only really won two races in his career, and he really is today showing off the talent that he's got that everybody said he had, but his results so far have never really showed it. Well, T-Mobile have had a lot of faith in this man. He's only 24, he won't be 25 till September. It's his first Tour de France. Yes, he's all, all he's ever done, really, is win a stage of the Tour de Suisse. But we've always known he's been a great talent. 
and he got into that breakaway this morning. Nobody will have marked him. He's unknown virtually. And there's a terrific attack on from the front of the peloton now. Well, again, it's Team Barlow World out, out on the mover. They've seen that, that there's a lot of control at the front end coming from Team Rabobank. And Barlow World have decided that as a, a wild card a selection for the Tour de France, they want to show the organisation, thank you very much for bringing us here. This may well be Alexander Efemkin. He's the twin brother of uh, another Efemkin who rides with Case de Pania, and he may well be today trying to show that he's the better of the two brothers. Well done, they Barlow World. The wildcard boys are making sure that the organisers um, are paid back for putting them in the Tour de France. I think it is Efekin, but, but we'll wait till we find out uh, for sure. It doesn't look like Felix Cardenas, the man perhaps we would have expected to have made the move. Uh, but he really has decided to bridge the gap here, and they haven't reacted at all. Well, the Norwegian flag at the side there, they'll have to wait a little while before they see their hero, uh, Tor Hushoff, because Tor Hushoff is in the group with all of the sprinters just a little bit further back. This is Michael Bogard, who's looking at retirement at the end of this year, but riding uh, superbly for the team. Michael Rasmussen is there in third position. Mick Rogers moving up uh, to the front end of the main field, not too far away from him. But this is turning out to be a rather strange <laughs> day on the first attempt of the mountains, and it looks as if David Miller now is about to call it a day too. Well, that's sad. In front of him is Patrice Algon, himself a former leader of the King of the Mountains, as indeed David Miller is now. There's Algon as our motorbike picks through the debris at the back. That acceleration hurt an awful lot of riders there. The other rider going out is Jens Voigt, the hero of the team, who has done very, very well in keeping them in touch with the leaders, and it's hurt a lot of Team CSC. This is Kurt Azel, uh, Atla Arvison also now, another workhorse. He's dropping off. This peloton is getting smaller, but none of the favourites are coming back. In you go, Quest, the oldest man in the race for CSC. He, too, is about to unhitch at the back. Well, that's an indication of the pressure now starting to bite in this group, and the pressure today is being dictated by the men of Orange, the Dutchman on the front end for Team Rabobank, who really are hammering out an infernal pace, and they're reducing the number of riders. I'll tell you one thing, that man at the front there, Michael Bogert, is doing a phenomenal job, and this is the damage, Phil, that is being done at the back. Well, uh, the leader of the... Uh... Uh, Francaise de Jeux, Cassar is in trouble too here as the white jersey there the line at the back now is getting very very ragged indeed there is Sandy Cassar he really is a man that should be at the front look at this now this is Michael Bogart here done a lot of hard riding at the front and uh, oh, sorry, this is the return of Fletcher we just cut back to the first man of the breakaway he's even got water for his boys they had a plan today there's no doubt about that and he's giving the leaders of his team water as well well as we look down here at the monastery of the Repressoire uh, building that was started back in 1151 this is an incredible battle on the slopes of the Col de la Colombière because this is a very difficult side the riders are going up we're now talking about a new name, a name that we've never mentioned before in the history of the Tour de France, Luz Gerdemann of Germany and T-Mobile. These are the two chasers, uh, Inigo Landeluz in the orange jersey there of Uscatel Uscari and David de la Fuente. Look at him bouncing on the saddle there. He's thinking about one thing, he's thinking about trying to grab himself the lead in the King of the Mountains classification. And Stefan Schumacher is also having a very difficult time with the first mountain of this year's tour. Well, Schumacher in his first Tour de France is uh, finding it's a little bit different to the classics. Uh, Christophe Lemervel is going back with him. Uh, sitting back here too is now the leader of Baller World. That is Alexander Epikin, so the breakaway rider isn't him because he's sliding off the back and our computer's not giving us any help at the moment as these riders crack and Sylvain Chavanel, the leader of the King of the Mountains, passes under the flag of the US of A. He also is going off the back at 20 kilometers to go and it's all being caused, all of the pain in the peloton, by Rabobank. Phil, there are not very many riders left in this group. It's a big surprise, I think, to everybody, the severity of the chase. Forget about what's happening at the front of the race with Gerdemann because all of that will change upside down again tomorrow, but we're seeing now the first sorting out at the front end of the main field of the big contenders. And the big, strong team in the peloton is turning out to be Team Rabobank, and that is a bit of a surprise to me. You can see now these two riders are trying to pull themselves back in. They're just around the corner. They will probably come up to uh, there. You can see Dmitry Fofanov around the corner in front of him at about 20 seconds. 
is the man who is setting this race on fire, Gerdeman of T-Mobile. Well, we're hearing that the Mayo Jean is now five minutes behind the action here. This is Dmitry Fofenhov, who has just been shed by his uh, erstwhile breakaway partner up front. Uh, it will now be Alandalus and De La Fuente who are possibly the bad threats as we get up near the top. This is Vladimir Karpic, I think, who is falling back into the real almost way. No, this will be the... Salvadelli. This is Salvadelli, is it? Didn't recognise his little bit of beard there, as he's... It just shows how long he was out front. He grew a little goatee beard, eh? he grew a little beard. Back into the pack for him. And sitting here at the back of the race, too, is uh, Juan Miguel Mercado, 131, but he's still in with the peloton. The flag of Australia flies proudly, and still in there is Cadell Evans. And following, look at the face of the great Michael Bogart. Still in there as well on the right-hand side, uh, thank you very much, is Andreas Cloden. So those two riders from Team Astana, Andreas Cloden and Alexander Vinokurov, were able to ride through their injuries yesterday, and they're riding themselves back into the Tour de France. Everybody wrote them off after that accident. Fofanov now has been joined by the two Spanish riders, Inigo Landaluz in the orange, David de la Fuente in the yellow. But the main field is having a serious sort out. Levi Leipheimer is still here. We know that Denny Menchov is still here. I caught a sign of George Hincapi a few moments ago, so I think he's still got a foot on the back step, back straight, back yep. step of the bus here this afternoon. But I'm amazed to see the riders from Astana have actually recovered from those serious injuries they had a couple of days ago. Alberto Contador is also here along with Popovic for Team Discovery Channel, so they've made the decisive move. There is the king of the mountain, Sebastian Sylvain Chavanel, but he is off the back here, and George is also now slipping away uh, because this has been a detached group, so George isn't with the leaders now as our cameras start to show us just who is left and who is up front in the Tour de France. Uh, Sinkiewicz is the T-Mobile rider there. This group is under pressure. Well, they're seriously under pressure. Fourth rider in that group there is uh, Cadell Evans, so his team have done a good job for him. He's still at the front end of the main field. Paolo Selvadelli is just going to disappear. He was in the early breakaway of 15 riders. He does not like the mountains of the Tour de France this afternoon. Savadelli now going through at the back of the group. He was in the breakaway. Let's have a look how many is he left in that group. About 25, 30 riders up here. As they continue to make their way up, this is the selection, the first big selection. Mercado is at the back of it. This will be the capture very shortly now. The man has been doing a lot of work here, Fofanov. Been passed by the first two chasers, couldn't hold on to them. As they disappear up front, it looks like they've split as well. They have, Landaluz has dropped De La Fuente. Now there's another turn up for the book. Well, we're getting to the steeper part of the climb now. De La Fuente still, that strange bouncing style that we got used to last year in the Tour de France. Bounces on the saddle, then gets out, bounces on those pedals, tries to find a little bit of pressure to stay in contact with Inigo Landaluz, who, as you said, Phil, earlier, has never really been a massive winner, but all of his uh, great success has been here, really, in the mountains of the, of the uh, Alps, because it was in the Dauphiné Liberate that he came to four a couple of seasons ago, and now he seems to be coming back to that form. That's exactly right, but the man who is throwing down the gauntlet today and could be riding into a yellow jersey of a T-Mobile in his first Tour de France is Lindus Gerdeman, beginning to froth at the mouth now, and I'm not surprised. Let's hope he can hang on. These are the legs of Lin Linus Gerdeman here, the German rider who has surprised everybody. He's ridden all of the 15 leaders off his back wheel. A second place on the Col de la Colombia at the moment is Landaluz. He's got rid of David de la Fuente. The pack behind has got about 20 or 30 riders left, and it is still under the escort of Michael Bogart and Rasmussen. Well, Michael Bogart is doing a phenomenal job. There's Levi Leipheimer over on the left-hand side of the road. You just saw he had his jersey completely wide open. Fourth position in that group is Le Cadell Evans, the Australian behind him. The French national champion is there as well, Christophe Moreau. Most of the big pre-race favourites are still very comfortably riding in this group. Poor old Paolo Salvadelli saying, what am I doing at the Tour de France again? Why don't I stick to the Giro d'Italia where I've had much more success in the past? But of course, he was in that breakaway of 15 riders. He's been dropped and he's away off the group of leaders now. Yes, done for the day. He was the Astana representative in the breakaway. He's gone straight through now and will just ride home. His Tour de France is a likely winner over. As Cadell Evans peeps into our picture, far left in that pink jersey, just watching the riders at the front, and those riders at the front 
include Michael Rasmussen in second wheel, who says this year, I don't want to just win the King of the Mountains for the third time, I want to win the Tour de France. Well, as we look here at Gerda Men, uh, just a few moments ago, I also saw in that group of the big names of the main field, uh, Al uh, Alejandro Valverde was there, Oscar Pereira was there, so we're still looking at the majority of the contenders that's a sore sight, isn't it, when you're at the front of the bike race because that little gap in the hills there is where he's aiming for and he's still got inside of two and a half kilometres to go to the summit. But he's got enough advantage to stay away from the main field, but does he have enough power to stay away from Inigo Landaluz, who is only 42 seconds behind him? Landaluz uh, riding, I must say, like we haven't seen him ride for a long, long time. He's felt strong enough to shed himself of the other climbers. And as we get towards the summit, it gets steeper. He may be able to claw back a little bit on Linus Gerdeman. Well, just looking back here, you can see that uh, it's now Case Stepania who've decided to take over from Team Rabobank. Still Michael Rasmussen riding to the front end of the main field. He will leap out of this pack to try and get himself a few points here. There's Mick Rogers just up alongside him. I have to say Mick Rogers' pedaling style looks very comfortable. Very comfortable. So too did Alejandro Valverde there, and he's put his team on the front to lift the tempo. Uh, there is Thomas Decker, still there, this young 22-year-old guy who's in that leading group in his first Tour de France. I'm sure he'll win a stage at some point uh, over the next couple of weeks of racing. But at the moment, we could be seeing uh, temporarily a surprise standing in the Tour de France. Linus Gerdeman is still in front and looking for yellow. There is the size of the select peloton now of the Tour de France, and we think just about everybody that matters is in there. Vladimir Gusev wears 113. He's not so su uh, superstitious, he says. He's in there as well for Team Discovery Channel. Well, it's nice to be able to wave the British flag for a change because also I noticed just sitting on the back of that group was number 158, and that happens to be Charlie Wigelius. Yes. Riding his first Tour de France, and he's sitting on the back there of that group for Team Liquigas. He's a great climber, Charlie. He won't hold any fears, but he's never had a shot at the Tour de France before. He's normally on the Liquid Gas team to help his teammates. Well, maybe now he's going to be one of the leaders of the team. These are the scenes here, the dizzy height. Oh, dear, isn't it the dizzy height? As you look over the shoulder of Gerdem and down the mountain there, this is the Col de Colombia. A little bit of a traffic block, but they are quite away in front of the T-Mobile rider. As he cuts a lone trail, but look at that, Paul Landaluz is closing in. Well, Landaluz is a very seasoned professional, so too, David de la Fuente hasn't given up yet. Look at the way he's bouncing all over that machine. He's riding now on sheer courage there, man in third position on the road. He knows that if he can get over the top of this climb within 30 seconds of the two men in front of him, the descent down from the summit of the Col de Colombier through Chinayon means he should be able to make the contact with them again. Maxim Iglinski has not given up hope yet. He's trying to hang on and keep this group in sight. Another youngster of the future, because there's a lot of new young riders in the Tour this year, and they're all finding what a different race this is to all the other races they ride every year. There's a group of 40. Uh, approximately in the group here now and the case de Palm squad have uh, Alejandro Valverde now setting the pace Oscar Pereiro there in second position looking very comfortable Valverde there in third Rasmussen Mick Rogers they're all moving to the front there there is Alberto Contador over on the left hand side you know Team Discovery Channel have got three men in there with his jersey right open there you can see Levi Leipheimer I also noticed but uh, Yaroslav Popovich was in the group as well for Team Discovery Channel. George Hincapi has been left behind. He's in the second group on the road, and uh, unfortunately, he's not been able to stay on the back step of the bus here this afternoon, suffering, I think, li think a little bit with the heat this afternoon, and, of course, with the speed of this first ascent of the first mountain of the Tour this year. I must say, Valverde there, just in our picture, looking very, very strong as though he's very happy with the situation right now there's a lovely shot of Leipheimer as well and there is uh, Kashikin is also there for Astana in that light uh, turquoise jersey these boys are concentrating there is Vino looking good he doesn't look in any difficulty at all at the moment he's riding on the wheel of Tadeusz Valjevic the champion of Slovenia well, these boys Gusev. are looking pretty settled right now Gusev he could be the big surprise of this Tour de France. He is such a talent as well. Well, he's the leader of the white jersey classification. I'm very impressed with the man just in front of him, though, because 
Alexander Vinokurov rode through yesterday on complete and utter courage. It was a crusade for him yesterday, I think, to get himself through that stage. He knows this is his last real chance of a crack at the Tour de France. There's Denny Menshoff looking comfortable there in the group two. This is really the first decanting we've had, Phil. Poor old Gerdemann's at the front now has all, all of a sudden found out just how difficult these final kilometres are of the Col de la Colombière. He attacked early on, I think, on youthful enthusiasm. Now he's got to try and keep that going to the summit of the climb. He's being chased by two seriously talented Spanish climbers. He's looking over his shoulder saying, I wonder where they are. Well, well there, there is Landaluz. As Landaluz is still slowly closing in on him here, the flag of Norway waves on. Uh, but he's nearly at the top now, and then he might take one or two risks. He won't really want the company of the Spanish riders, although he might, if he's not too tired, be the quicker, quickest of the sprinters if all three get together. 15 kilometres to go almost to the finish here, but we've got to get to the top of this climb, and then the descent will start. I don't think there's any chance they will be caught before the finish, but they want time as well, if, uh, especially if uh, Gatherman is going to pull on the leader's yellow jersey and what an achievement that would be today but tomorrow is a huge day and he may be selling his energy out today well it doesn't matter if he's got a chance of getting himself the yellow jersey on his shoulders for just one time in his career and he can do that today well go for it this is John Gadre at the back here, number 66. We've seen him ride a, a lot in the Giro d'Italia. We figured this guy was going to be a great climber of the future, but he too is unable to, um, to take in the first major climb of the Tour. We're having a serious sorting out on this climb. It is always difficult, the first mounting of the, the Tour, because you've been riding on the flat using a different kind of gears. The Tricolore, or the champion of France, looks very comfortable. He's not too worried about the situation. He looks good today. We are having a lot of riders shot off the back, but we're having none of the fancied men. They are riding to the top as a group here, and all of them are looking very, very comfortable. Iban Mayo is here, Leipheimer is here, Cadell Evans, Michael Rogers. They are all here. They're not in difficulty as we pick off the riders now. This is Pino being swept up by the tempo of the Case de Pan. They've got their two top men, Pereira and Valverde. The Menchoff is here for Rabobank and Rasmussen. I can't think of anybody who's fancied to win this tour being left behind at the day. Possibly the one man I haven't seen, but I'm sure he's there, is Carlos Sassa. Well, I was just thinking exactly the same thing. I was looking down that group to see if I could see any riders from Team CSC, and I didn't really, so far, identify Carlos Sastra or Frank Schleck. But we only get a chance to see the front of the main field and the back of the main field. He could very well be comfortably sitting right in the middle. Here's one of the riders who was in that early breakaway. Jérôme Pinot has gone straight through. He can't get onto the back step of the bus either this afternoon. But after all, he put an awful lot of energy into the breakaway. 15 kilometres to go to the finish. He's almost to the top of the climb as well, so he'll be having a high finish today. We're just drawing back here. This is Inigo Landaluz. He's looking for the one man who's ahead and riding like a man possessed today. I must say, is Linus Gerdemann. The German rider was second in the Tour of Germany last year. They don't have these sort of mountains in Germany. And you get some idea of the slopes now, especially when people who are running can keep up with you. And uh, Elvis Presley reincarnated here on the climb. The peloton have made an impression, but not really a great deal. They've probably put back a minute on this rider on the whole thing. Oh, oh dear me, that was a bit close. Well, uh, that wasn't actually the motorbike rider's fault. I think Gerdeman now is going through very a tired, very nasty very zone. He's just got to get himself to the top of the climb. Spanish supporters there, I think, a little That's bit partisan. Not that is That's totally not illegal. And in fact, it, it, you'll get him disqualified if you do that. And he'll get penalised, even though he never solicited the help. So you've got to watch out for these Spanish riders. But you know, it was a little bit of a lucky swoop there. I think you're right about it, Gerdeman. He is getting tired. Uh, motorbikes have got to be careful where they stop, though, because these boys are under full cry as they go round that motorbike. And I think and I hope the motorbike learned a lesson. Well, you don't take the riders' line on a bend. Well, this man is in a complete and utter zone. He's just trying to survive. He's probably never suffered like this in his life before. He's just begging this climb to be finished, to beg this climb to go over. Yeah, Bram tanking his back. There is Carlos Sastra over on the left-hand side. So he is in the group. 
He was obviously hiding away from the front end of the peloton. One kilometre to go for the big contenders of this year's Tour de France. And very shortly, they will be plunging down towards the finish. I think that's Jose Ivan Guterres as well, about to be picked up by the rest. So he's lost five minutes on this climb since he cracked big time. One kilometre to go for Valverde's bunch of pace makers. So our man up front must be virtually at the summit. I hope we get to see him cross over the top of the Col de la Colombia as they continue to crack here. This will be Marcus Foten, who was battling for the white jersey in the Tour de France last year. In the end, he gave it away to Cunigo in the final time trial. Here we are now. Uh, well, it's a man we would never have picked, but he's coming up a massive crowd, a channel of noise for Linus Gerdemans now. He is going to be the first man over the top of the Col de la Colombia. And if he descends big enough and fast enough, a yellow jersey awaits him in the Grand Bournon. Well, it's a very tricky descent. He leads over the summit there. He's got about a 30-second advantage over Inigo Landaluz. And that looks a little bit scary. It gives you an idea of just what he's going to plunge down to. Landaluz now is looking to accelerate up to the top of the climb. And I tell you what, Phil, he is going to take all kinds of risks. We are looking now at 18 seconds for Inigo Landaluz. He will charge down this mountain and he will take serious risks to try and get himself back into the race and think about a victory. There is Popovich on the far side. Right close up to us was Levi Leipheimer as well. We saw Carlos Sastra riding at the front end of the main field a few moments ago, so he is in there. I haven't seen Frank Schleck. There is Chris Horner, I think, riding at the back of the group too. Now, that is a phenomenal ride by Chris Horner. Well, he is there to look after Cadell Evans. He's a very, very good climber, Chris Horner, and this has been, for him, probably an OK climb because there's nobody of the favoured riders been dropped as far as we can see. Possibly Frank Schleck, but he wasn't seen as the likely winner. It's always been on the shoulders of Sastra. Uh, but this is a huge push. Alberto Contador is in here for Discovery Channel. Leipheimer is. So too is Gusev. And this is an attack by Rasmussen for the points at the top of the King of the Mountains. He wants to get a few points in the bank now because he is the King of the Mountains for the last two years in the Tour de France. He really wants a podium finish this year, though, and he might yet get it. Contador, tempo riding on the left of our picture there. Gusev on the back. No, this isn't Gusev here. This is Mercado who's sitting at the back, an agriturble. Gusev was a little bit further up in front on the left-hand side of the main field, so he's comfortable in there. We're picking up another rider who is in the early breakaway, Fabian Wegman. The man who's riding away here, the Michael Rasmussen, he really is becoming the new king of the mountains in the Tour de France. He won't be in the leader's jersey at the end of today, but I think the way he's jumping out of the pack there, Phil, he probably will be tomorrow. Cadell Evans, Carlos Sastra trying to hang on behind Alberto Contador there. This rider, every man he picks off, of course, he gets more points at the top of the climb. Double points today, as is the rule, if the category of the climb, the last climb of the day, is second, first, or all category, they double the points. So there's 30 for the winner, that's gone. Gerdemans has got that. L Lando loses second. De La Fuente is over in third. 12 kilometres to the finish now as the riders in the Tour de France have really found out what this race is all about. Mikel Astraloza dropping back. You can see these riders are dropping off the back end of the group. That's Charlie Wagela slipping back now with Juan Miguel Mercado also. I don't think we will see Michael Rasmussen getting enough points today to get himself the lead in the King of the Mountains classification because Sylvain oh, Chauvin has going on here. This is a blockage at the front. What AG2R. is going on here? That well, team it's... car is in it's an AG2R's team car as well. Completely blocked the road there, he should have gone forward, but Rasmussen is through, safe and over the top. I'm not sure what position he's gone over, because I don't know how many of that breakaway still exist. Well, he was just uh, catching up there with Martin Elminger, who's in the leading breakaway, and if the car hadn't have been there, he may well have pulled himself back into the wheel there of Elminger. But he's just ahead of nearly all of the major favourites of the Tour. We have had a decanting, we'll have a completely different overall classification. Three minutes and 20 seconds is the deficit of the main field, and now, Phil, it is going to be a massive charge down to the line. They've got a 10-kilometre descent here, and it's a rip-roaring technical descent. I've just got my fingers crossed that everybody gets down safely. Well, the seconds that counts, Gerdeman is on his way down, he's being chased by Landaluz, who's only just behind him, De La Fuente is back at a minute, and there's the rider at the front now, and he is the revelation of the day. Chavanel will keep his lead tonight in the King of the Mountains, 
with his 42 points, but it's getting less and less. Looking at the ascent there, 45, 46 minutes it took the rider Gerdes Lindemann, uh, uh, Linus Gerdemann, to climb the mountain today. Now he's going to fly. He's sensing the greatest moment of his career. And Lander Luz is having a terrific job, but I don't know whether he can get back onto him. Well, we're celebrating there. You just saw the fireworks at the side of the road, celebrating the passage of the Tour and, of course, the 14th of uh, July, best French Bastille Day. Not much for the French to cheer about just yet because it looks as if it's going to go to either the Germans or the Spaniards. Landerloos will take a lot of risks on this descent. It's a real technical descent. You can see this as we swing around the corner here. It gets a little bit easier once you go through the town of Chinayon, but it's still a rapid charge down to the finish. A long line now, you've got to stay alert. Those fingers will always be near the brake pads, but you'll try not to use them. You'll watch for anybody altering the line. You've got to rely a lot on the boy in front, not making a mistake. At the moment, it's pretty routine and it's very quick. It's not like this all the way down the col, though. It gets tighter at the bottom as we'll go round sharp, herping bends. From what we have seen of Linus Gerdemans, Paul, he's relishing the race down to the Grand Bonin. Well, he's got a big advantage. He's not got to worry at all about the main field. He's only really got to worry about one man, and the one man is just behind him, and that is Inigo Landerloos. We're getting time checks popping through that it's around about 24 seconds, his advantage. On this part of the course, he won't lose very much at all. It's very straight. He's getting down into a very precarious, low-profile skiing-type aerodynamic position. I hope he doesn't hit a bump like that, because that would be rather sore. Yeah. It does get technical, though, once he goes through the town here of Shino, and this is where he's starting to come into. And that's when we start to go into the zigzags, which will take him down into the valley floor. Eight kilometres, eight minutes should see him to the finishing line with the help of the Columbia. He's pedalling the highest gear he's got on that bike now, those long legs here driving him towards the finish. He started the day 58 seconds behind. He gets a bonus on the line of 20, so he's only got to win by 39 seconds to be the leader. And that, of course, is over Cancellara, not the rest of the riders. He's heading for yellow. He's charging down for the yellow jersey. Even if it gets caught by Inigo Landerloos, he's almost certainly going to be the new leader of this bike race at the end of the afternoon. He's entering now into the outskirts of the upper ski resort of Chinayon. He's extended his advantage to 28 seconds. The main field is still hovering at 3 minutes and 22. We're looking back to see where the orange jersey of the Basque rider is, and it's uh, actually going backwards here. He seems to be an awful long way behind. That is a lot more than 30 seconds to me, Phil. There yeah. is the Basque rider. Let me quickly tell you the leaders over the top. Gerdeman was followed by Landerloos, De La Fuente a minute back. Then came Lefebvre, Fofanov, Elmiger, all in the breakaway. Then it was Rasmussen from the peloton. So he went over in seventh place. So there's only six riders surviving from the breakaway. And I would think Elmiger and Fofanov have already been caught. Uh, quite short, they will be, get, they'll be put, put in at, at the back end of the group of the favourites. 191 there is Alexander Vinokurov. He will be breathing, I feel, I think today, a sigh of relief because there are not very many riders left in this group of favourites and Alexander Vinokurov is still there and still present. Every day that goes by now, that man is going to start to improve. Do not remove him from your, from your list of favourites to win this year's tour. No, there he is, sat at the back. He'll be relieved today. It's all behind him. There hasn't been one favourite make a mistake today. They are all in this pack waiting for showdown tomorrow. And, in fact, they're trying to lead here Valverde to the possible stage win. But I don't think they're going to catch this boy. He's got to not make a mistake, not lose his head, control himself on the way down. He's doing everything now to be the next Maillot Jaune of the Tour de France. And that must have been beyond his wildest dreams. Well, this is a brilliant situation to be in when you're at the front of the race. You can take your own line around these corners. He's enjoying these corners. Sweeps over to the right, cuts into the apex, not losing any momentum at all, using as much oh. of the road as possible. He pulled it right in there to maybe six inches away from that wall, but that's what he needed to do to keep his pace nice and high. I actually think he's riding away here from he Indigo oh, Andalus because Indo Andalus is a couple of corners behind him. He's definitely riding away. That was a sharp bend, but his line is perfect. It wasn't a close call. He was just using all of the road he had there. My little O, and here we go, was because of what oh, you could see from the helicopter. It's a rather nasty drop. If you do flip over that wall, you're straight down, and we don't want to see that happen. 
And so he's riding, I think, absolutely superb. He's showing terrific descending skills. Well, there is uh, the man who was just in front. That was Elmiger. Rasmussen has also now been pulled back into the fold. Rasmussen only went off the front of the group there, Phil, to get himself those points. He will come out and play again tomorrow. Alejandro Valverde is riding now like a serious challenger. But at the back, Alexander Vinokurov, despite all the bandages, despite all the covering of the wounds on his body, is still there. Yes, yes, we know, Alexander. It's been a tough day, but, mate, you're still there. He's still there, and he's cool. Five kilometres to go, or three miles to the finish now. Five minutes cycling for this man. Down in the valley is where we're going. From where we're sitting now, we can see the crowd waiting to see the mauve jersey flash in front of our eyes up on the mountain because we can see from the valley this particular stretch of the coal of the Colombia, as can the crowd, who are all turning with their backs to the finishing line to see this great ride. He's in our sights now as he comes down this road here. They can see now that it is Gerdeman who's leading. He got into the breakaway, he not only survived it, he made the story of the day here. Well, it was 22 seconds at the top of the climb. It's now 32 seconds, the advantage of Linus Gerdeman. As we see now, the remnants of uh, Reiners trying to stay in contact. There is Fofanov, so he too has been picked up. As we look at the rear of the peloton here, there are only four riders left of that 15, and this man has flown away. Four kilometres to go for Linus Gerdemans. He is now clear of the field. He can see uh, the Grand Bonhomme off his left shoulder. He's shortly going to be down there. And he has been such a sensation today. He started the day, Paul, 58 seconds off yellow. He knows now the jersey awaits. Well, that's what's waiting for him for the end of the day this afternoon, but he's going to have a very tough day tomorrow defending it because we go back into the big mountains of the Alps. The straight road now, he gets down into that skiing position, keeping his pace as high as possible as Landaluz now goes under four kilometres to go. So we're looking now at uh, Gerdeman. He's in the outskirts of the Grand Bournon. He's got about uh, three kilometres to go. It's fairly flat now. It will still go down a fraction till he gets to the final bend and takes that sweeping corner. He's going to turn right here at the church in the very heart of this little ski resort, nestled in the slopes of the Alps. There you can see he takes the right-hand bend. He now is almost certainly going to win not only the stage, but take the yellow jersey. Round the hairpins, they've arranged uh, this special plateau so we can approach the line without shooting straight through it and off the mountain. We're onto the flat roads now to circumnavigate the town of the Grand Bournon. There you can see him using all of the road. This has to be an incredible moment in the life of Linus Gerdeman here, Paul. He's going to be yellow now. Well, I'll tell you one thing. This man now, all of a sudden, is not feeling any more pain of the day. He's starting to feel the elation of victory. He can find that little bit more. He can accept the pain more now because he knows this pain is going to pay at the end of the day. He realises that he's only got that final bend. I hope he looked at the race book last night to realise there's a very sharp left-hander. Then he will line up. Strangely enough, the last time the Tour came here in 2004, it was a German rider who was second on the stage, beaten by Lance Armstrong, that was Andreas Cloden. This time, history has changed the books because it's going to be a German rider who wins the stage and takes the yellow jersey. And in theory, it should have been Cloden. He started the day in second place, 33 seconds off, but he's in that back group as far as we know, although we haven't seen him uh, in that chase group of the big pack. Here comes the charge now, they're sweeping up virtually everyone and it's all cased upon of Valverde and Pereiro who are leading the charge into town. They're sweeping up as far as I can work out, there's probably four riders from the break left in front. And those four riders will be hoping they will survive to get some recompense for the work they've done. Here is the left-hand bend, the sweeper now, and he will start to slowly climb up towards the finish line. He Oops. should as well feel, uh, get a two-pronged attack here because not only the, the win of the stage, the yellow jersey, but he'll also take over the lead in the white jersey competition right. as well. So what a day for this young man. And what a day really for T-Mobile who've uh, put this structure together because at the end of the day, Bob Stapleton brought a very young team to the Tour de France this year and they're starting to reap the benefits. Let's not forget though, Mick Rogers is still the man for the overall win if they can keep it all together. 36 seconds over Lanaluz. He can start to enjoy this. Yes, at the end of the day, this will be seen as a diversion. Of course it will, because Rogers will be their man to try and carry the flag tomorrow. 
because the strength that this man has left on the Alps, I don't think he can produce it again tomorrow. But yes, he will be in the lead in both classifications, yellow and white, because he's only 24 and three-quarter years of age. Under 25, that competition, he is under the one kilometre to go. He's going to ride 700 metres. He won't remember it because he's in a trance here and he's very, very tired. Well, he won't even start to enjoy it until he gets right down towards the finish line because he wants to get as much time as possible because he knows tomorrow is going to be a very tough day in the Alps. I wonder if he watched the television a few years ago in 2004 when Andreas Cloden was just beaten on the line to Lance Armstrong. There will there be no coming back now of any other riders into the slipstream of this man because he's still got 36 seconds advantage and he's still not slowing down, he's still going for the win here, he's still going for as much time as possible, now he's inside the banners, he now knows Phil that he is home and safe, but he still can't yet see the finish line 400 metres to the line, I should imagine his team manager Brian Holm can't believe this, he only had one man in the break of 15 and that man is coming home alone now, to the cheers of the crowd, the adrenaline will pump as he races to the line at 24 and three quarter years of age. He's started the day 58 seconds behind the yellow jersey. He gets a bonus of 20 and there's no one near him anyway. He moves clearly into yellow for tomorrow's next day in the Alps. This will go down as his greatest victory. He's only been a pro for two seasons. T-Mobile brought a young team to this race, didn't think they could win it. They better start thinking now because yellow awaits this rider. That is the view across the Lac de Roseland, which is a beautiful, beautiful view. And don't forget that at the moment, only two riders are out of control. Michael Rogers up in the front group, along with Rasmussen. Hincapi has fallen back a little bit now into that second group as we now see the big peloton containing the other stars winding its way up the climb. Well, a little bit of downhill on the flat is over as we look here at Cedric Vasseur on the front as the peloton now are beginning to wonder just what really has hit them today. There is the leader still in the King of the Mountains, Sylvain Chavanel. Four minutes, two seconds now, the yellow jersey, and in fact, his teammate Michael Rogers was four minutes, three seconds behind him overnight. Rogers isn't quite there, bit of trouble Somebody here at the moment, and this is Mareni, he was in the second group with George Hincapi, and oh, look at that, he clipped the back wheel, ouch, a nasty fall, well, lack of that's, attention. That's his own fault, uh, not was. necessarily lack of attention, I think he was on the rivet and a little bit tired. He's a seasoned pro, he's got himself back up, but he'll be a little bit more embarrassed and hurt with that when he touched the wheel of the Uskatel Uskadi rider just in front of him. Uh, there's a lot of riders very tired, and that accident there really was more from fatigue than anything else. He's just having a look, making sure the bike is not too seriously damaged, and he will shortly rejoin that group that he was with. Well, he's with George Hincapi and Sergio Paulinho. They are a bit behind at the moment because Cole, Le Mavel and Colom have been caught now by Michael Rogers, particularly, and Michael Rasmussen especially. Stefan Goubert and da David Arroyo, here they are. Seven riders with a terrific tempo here. They're going to push this yellow jersey back group to over five minutes by the summit, I think. And there's still two more climbs to come. Well, I just caught a glimpse there, Phil, uh, as we looked at the back of the flags and the riders here as they come up towards the summit of this climber, picking up a little bit of a tailwind. And that advantages the climbers because they can go so fast on a climb like this. In the King of the Mountains classification, Sylvain Chavanel started the day with 42 points. Michael Rasmussen had 22 points. He's gets, he'll get himself 15 points if he can go over the top of this climb in first place, and that will bring him right up into second place in that competition with two big climbs to come. And sooner or later, they're going to have to close that gap a little bit on Michael Rogers and Michael Rasmussen because those boys, well, especially Rogers, can ride a great time trial. And look at this, Eric Zabel is here still. Good old Eric Zabel, that's the one thing that Tom Bonin was worried about, the points that could be grasped by Eric Zabel on the mountain stages. He won't get any points this afternoon, but Eric Zabel, sometime or another, will get over a big mountain stage and get himself some more points. He will continue to be a threat in the green jersey competition, I think, all the way to Paris. Christophe Moreau there, the champion of France, looks very comfortable, but I think maybe felt a little frustrated with the way the race is developing. 
He's I got reckon. a teammate in that group with him, Cyril Dessel, but I think he would be like he would like to see somebody else come forward and start nailing back this group because this is a very dangerous group with Michael Rogers and Michael Rasmussen in it. Well, looking down from the helicopter, there's only six riders in that lead group. There should be seven. So is that a rider who has been dropped back there? As he starts to look as though it might well be. Somebody has been left on the climb here. We don't know why at the moment. We were with them a few moments ago. There were seven. Looking right around this craggy little climb in the Alps. It is a really, really difficult climb. Still three and a half kilometres to grind to the top. This will be the George Hincapie group. That's the second group on the road. The peloton is a long way back here just now with the big favourite in it. I'm just wondering who is going to win this year's Tour de France because there doesn't seem to be a demonstrative figure in the race. Well, nobody yet has uh, taken the race by the horns and stamped their authority on it. Yesterday, it seemed as if it was going to be Case de Pagna. They looked so strong yesterday with Alejandro Valverde, but he is not enjoying this climb here this afternoon. The rider who's been dropped for the moment is Christophe Lemervel, dropped or had a mechanical. That's a horrible sight of you coming in the other way, isn't it? Well, it certainly is. Uh, there you get a chance to see the long line of the road that these riders are snaking their way up. There, uh, the little bit of gaggle of cars there is the front end of the main field, but this is a massive gap. And the main field this afternoon must be wondering what are we going to do to pull ourselves back to Michael Rasmus and Michael Rogers and Bernard Cole. It is actually, Phil, a very large group, and I think the reason they're riding like this, the big challenges, is to try and stay in contact with as many of their teammates as possible so as not to be isolated down towards the end. Well, sooner or later, we are going to see an explosion. This is Cedric Vasseur here on the far right chatting the concentration of Eric Zarr. Well, not normally a climber at this level, is right on the front rank of cyclists here in that light blue jersey, which is a good indicator, too, that this race is not full on for the main peloton, who are riding at 4 minutes and 22 which is now putting Michael Rogers as the virtual leader of the Tour de France off his teammates back. He takes the yellow jersey for the moment, but we've still got two first category climbs and about two kilometres of this first category climb to go before we get to the finish line. So this race can still change any way which you want. In fact, the presence of Cedric Vasseur and Eric Zabel in this group field indicates that the chase is certainly not on in the main field. They're quite happy to ride along at this tempo. They're probably banking on the fact that they can accelerate on the final climb of the day and pull back an advantage. But you can't give a man like Michael Rasmussen and Michael Rogers a five-minutes lead on a stage like this because it's going to be so difficult to pull it back. And, of course, little David Arroyo there, number 12, He's sitting very pretty, thank you very much, and he is, in fact, uh, going to be the joker in the pack for Case de Pagna. I'm just wondering what is wrong with the cleats on Rasmussen's feet. He keeps playing with that left shoe as if there's something wrong. Maybe he's just releasing the pressure on his foot because it's very hot out there. Your feet do swell with the conditions, and maybe he's having to release the straps on his uh, shoes a little bit. The cleats normally lock in like a ski binding underneath. We've moved that back down a notch here. Between these two groups, there is uh, Christophe Lemervel. I reckon we'll pick him up very shortly. And it is Discovery Channels. Paulinho, followed by George Hincapi, setting the pace here. They're riding very sensibly. They didn't try to hang on to Rasmussen, who just blew straight through them. That would have been stupid. They'd have gone into the red zone and dropped off the back. They might well climb back to that front group. Well, at a minute and 15, I know the ability of George Hincapie when it comes to going downhill. And what he's probably doing with Sergio Paolino is riding at their own pace, a comfortable place, making sure that he's riding at around about 85 to 90% of his maximum heart rate. And then he will take a few risks on the descent. George is a very good descender, as opposed to Ma Mike Ro Michael Rasmussen, who's not, strangely enough, coming from a mountain bike background, not that good at going downhill fast. As we well know, we've seen him tumble a few times, uh, but he is a great mountain biker. He should be a much better bike handler than he appears to be on the road. Anyway, this is the peloton. It's starting to get a little bit bigger now as riders climb their way back in. Obviously, they'll be surprised that they see the tail of the cars and they might be inspired to try and catch up again. You can see it's not climbing very, very quickly here on what is a beautiful part of the Alps. It's an area we don't come into that often as we race up towards the Val d'Isere area where the race will restart on Tuesday morning don't forget there's a rest day for the riders tomorrow and they're in a very hilly area to go training but I think they'll probably want to do that because they have another hard day in the Alps on Tuesday whoops a daisy as uh, this is a rider here now being picked up uh, by the peloton 
Well, the team cars moving forward now. They're moving forward to look after their riders in the front group. Uh, what is a rather scary is that gap has almost gone up to the five-minute mark, Phil, for the leading group containing two serious Tour de France contenders and the yellow jersey group. Well, you can see how these riders are finding this climb so difficult now. Just, uh, Fabian Weckman is the rider in white on the right, Cedric Vasser in the centre. They're sweeping up the riders from that original breakaway that went after 25 kilometres when Thomas Volkler attacked. A little chat here between teammates, and he's pinching his bottle there, wasn't he? Well, I think the teammate in front there had picked up a couple of bottles along the route as we now look at one kilometre to go to the summit of the Corme de Rosalon. I wonder, uh, are we taking any bets onto who's going to get the maximum points here over no. the summit? Only if you don't pick Rasmussen. <laughs> I think I picked him as my man for the day here this afternoon, yeah. and he's uh, certainly rising to that occasion. Looking over his shoulder, just being a little bit of attentive there to Stefan Goubert. Mike Rogers, I don't think, will make any move at all for that because Mick is thinking a lot further down the road. Well, Goubert might try to give him a run for the money, but uh, Rasmussen is no great sprinter, but he might go a little bit early here. He has his uncanny acceleration on the uphill stretches that nobody else can match. We've gone back to the peloton with the yellow jersey in it. There he is, down in the centre of our picture, having a wonderful day as a race leader. Very content that his team captain, Michael Rogers, currently the leader on the road, because the peloton is 5 minutes and 17 seconds back of that front group. Now, we'd like to go up and see the sprinter, uh, if we could. Well, we'd be looking at about 500 metres to go to the finish. This really is a magnificent backdrop for the main field. And uh, the important thing is, uh, in the main field, they're not really chasing. They're looking up the road, Phil, and they can't see the tail of the convoy because they are now five minutes and 15 seconds. And that man uh, looks like uh, Borat, I think, isn't it? I he's think got it his... must be. It's got to be. It's got to be. Well, the, the field haven't noticed him yet, but they might. As well, the field come up here, almost a little smile here on the face of uh, Balan, I think it is, yes. Cedric Vasseur. Uh, the main field are uh, really starting now, I think, to panic a fraction because we're getting up to uh, rather astronomical time gaps on this stage. Cyril Dessel is the rider there with the white glasses on, sitting, sitting behind uh, Cedric Vasseur. And with a bit of luck now, we'll get a chance to see uh, who is going to get maximum points going over the top of this climb. Michael Rasmussen, the winner of the King of the Mountains for the last two seasons, is now trying to lay the foundations for his victory for a third time in a row. Well, this is huge for Michael Rogers as well here. He won't bother about sprinting for the mountains, I don't think, but he's still very much in the driving seat here now. The yellow jersey virtual on the road. Rasmussen leads and we're not far from the summit. I think Stefan Goubert will try to take him on because he's been scoring in the early climbs today. And he's having a very good day, but really, it's like David and Goliath. And that was a cool catch there by Antonio Colom. He saw his team helper, got his drink at the top of the climb. We're nearly over the top, and there is no sprint. And they've given it to Rasmussen. They salute the king of the mountains of the tour for the past two years. And so it's Guber in third place there as they go over the top and Cole in second. Well, with those points, Phil, 15 points as he goes over the top there, he's going to move up into second place, so right on the shoulder now of Sylvain Chavanel. A little bit of chaos a little bit further back as the teams try to move forward. That's Credit Agricole, and what he wants to do is move forward to see where his man is, uh, Christophe Lemovel. Well, he's caught currently in no man's land. He was in that leading group, but now he's halfway between the leading group and this group of George Hincapi and Paulinho. Well, just looking at time checks flying through on the computer, 5.16 is the big gap, but this group of Hincapi going through, they're around about three minutes themselves right now. Mavell, we think, is just ahead. They've left, no, they can't be three minutes because they're nearly up to the top of the climb here. And there's the clock counting. So they have got a good chance here of rejoining on the descent. It's a minute and 15 seconds to the George Hincapri group, and Christophe Lemovel is caught somewhere in the middle. I think they may well make the junction on the descent because I know how fast George Hincapri can go downhill. Well, let's hope they go for it and make the break a little bit bigger. 
Well, this is a big day in the mountains, and I certainly didn't expect it to be like this. I thought that Michael Rasmussen might try and do something spectacular. He loves the mountains, and for one, he is certainly not afraid of them at all. We're looking down on the main field. The big question which is going through my mind is who is going to chase, who's going to take the responsibility. It is so important now to put your cards on the table and say, I can win the tour. I'm going to bring my team to the front and I'm going to chase down. But Phil, just looking at this main field, I'm really not sure who has got the guts to lay their team on the line right now to say, we can win this. There's Cadell Evans. Well, Cadell Evans the is there, but not moving, is he? He's not. He's just going over with the group yet again. Christophe Moreau going over with the group. Valverde has survived here quite clearly now. Uh, Chavanel has thrown the towel in as leader in the King of the Mountains. He's no points left at the top. Alexander Vinokurov is there, though, and his team are still with a large number of riders in it. Also, Andreas Cloden is not far away. They've got six riders there, actually, because the rider at the back there is Iglinski, and he's the national champion. His jersey just a little bit darker than the other ones. Yeah, six riders, one in the lead makes seven, so that's uh, quite an interesting combination for them. The two top men are here. This is uh, a very much a cat-and-mouse game just now as they go through the last kilometre towards the top of the climb. We are moving through the cars here just to check out. This is at the very back of the race. The long, thin line, the peloton still going through and that one-kilometre banner. And that looks like Michael Rogers there on the way down. Well, the time Jack over the top there. In fact, Christophe Lemovel was at 52 seconds. He's only about... 20 seconds in front of the group containing George Hincapie and this is how to take a drink on board at high speed you've got to have uh, snail steel nerves of steel if you're a bike rider but you also have pretty much nerves of steel when you're driving the car behind well there's the result of the Corme de Roseland column going six the Mevel in seventh so he's in there somewhere we just haven't seen him and I'm very interested to see Michael Rogers here Paul has decided to race down this mountain and it's up to the rest to follow him well, uh, Michael is a pretty good descender himself. For the man who's the weakest descender in the group is actually the man who is the best climber. Now, this is the next group on the road, and you can see Mikkel Astralosa has moved uh, right up to the front because he's joined the group there that was up the road a few moments ago with uh, Felix Cardenas in the red and white jersey of Team Barlow World. The rider just sitting on the back there for Team Quickstep is Carlos Barredo. And we saw him riding as a really good team player in the early season classics. I think he made a mistake there and missed his drink and he's gone back into the line, so that could be costly. Have to try and repeat that a little bit later on. 5.07 and counting. Michael Rogers is consolidating his leader virtuel in the Tour de France right now. Could be a yellow jersey waiting for him. He could be across the bedroom from one T-Mobile rider to another by the end of the day. But a little early to get excited. Two more first category climbs to come. That is not as hard, though, as this one we've just gone over. Well, the race situation is basically the field is scattered all over the Alps here this afternoon. We can see the front end of the main field starting to encourage themselves. Uh, Alessandro Balan doing a lot of the work. It's a minute and 17 from the leading group of six riders back to the George Hincapi group. It's three minutes and 47 seconds back to the group we just saw a few moments ago of uh, Mikel Astralosa and Felix Cardenas. But it's a lot further back, five minutes and seven seconds back to the front end of the main field, who all of a sudden now are probably starting to panic a fraction. Once they go over the summit here, we'll get an exact time check. They haven't quite gone round the corner. It's five minutes and counting. And as they cross the line over the summit of the Corme de Roselon, there it is, 5.09. Alessandro Balan, Cedric Vasseur. They're taking on board uh, little pieces of newspaper there, and that's a, a very old-fashioned tradition that these riders do. And what they do is they put that newspaper up their jerseys to actually stop the cold air going through and getting a real bad chest chill on the chest. Looking at the shadows of the sun, a very hot day. Two more climbs to come. The next climb is 15 kilometres long. The climb after that, 18 kilometres long, but they do get a couple of kilometres respite down to the finishing line. Well, uh, just two kilometres for the rest of the day. That's very nice, thank you very much. They're over the top then of the uh, first category climb, the big first category climb of the day. And now they're probably going to go downhill for about 25 kilometres. And I'll tell you one thing, at the end of this descent, what you will find is your arms are starting to ache because you're battling with the front end of your machine. 
Just sitting here, this is Antonio Colum at the rear. Stefan Goubert is there. This is David Arroyo. Then there's Bernard Cole. They've caught Michael Rogers. And now comes uh, through uh, Michael Rasmussen. Two big stars of the Tour de France who are running away from the favourites just now. 5.03 back to the men who matter. This is turning out to be a very interesting Tour de France just now. And uh, by the time we get to the top of the next mountain, the King of the Mountains leader will be Michael Rasmussen. I don't think there'll be any doubt of that. Of course, they've got to stay away, but with a five-minute lead, they should still be clear. You see, they went up the climb in 55.21. I told you it would be almost an hour, and the peloton tried to make it perfect for me. 58.22 for the peloton. Well, that's a long time to go uphill, but they certainly went up the hill a lot slower than these riders at the front end of the main field. The Kazakhstan Railways here. And we're looking at uh, the man at the back here, Antonio Colom, and he is the joker in the pack for Alexander Vinokurov and Andreas Cloden. A little bit later on, he will do nothing at all to contribute, Phil, to the success of this breakaway we're following. Well, the scenery is stunning. We're enjoying it. Uh, the riders here are making a real race of it from the very first hour today. Attack after attack. Michael Rogers got into an early move, and they couldn't catch him. And now he's in a group. It's come down slightly since the descent he started. 4.56 uh, as we continue on the way down. There were seven riders up here. We are only six now. We can't find the location of Christophe Lemervel. He seems to have disappeared. But I'm counting seven riders in this league group at the moment. But this is the second group on the road. This will be the George Hincapi group because there is Sergio uh, Paulinho. And I was just trying to see if I could see a green and white jersey. So I feel that Christophe Mavel must still be up ahead of this group. Well, if he is, he's only just by a fraction. A little bit of panic on board. One team now has decided this is much too much. And it's Team Lamprey have decided to come to the front. Uh, Balan is up there at the front. And surely another team will come forward now to start to chase. In fact, I can see uh, three riders, four riders there from uh, Predictor Lotto. Maybe this is the moment when Cadell Evans is going to take the responsibility and show this peloton that he is the big favourite to win the Tour de France this year because at some time or another, if you want to win the Tour, you've got to bang on the table and prove to everybody that you have control and that you are in control. Tricky few corners there. And you may notice there's no safety barriers here at all. If you uh, get it wrong on one of these corners, you've got a long way down. There is Christophe Lemervel. He's been picked up by the group now. So this is the group of George Hincapi, Sergio Paolino, and uh, we're now looking at an eight-man chasing group. So the race situation is six leaders chased by a group of eight, chased by a group of four, and chased by the group of the peloton, which contains the majority of the pre-race favourites. So I knew he was there, Paul. Here he is now, tagged onto the back. He's having a great day, Christophe Lemervel, but he's got to hold on to the next climb now. We drop down here for quite a way. We'll drop down for a while, then we'll start the climb up to the next one, which will start at around about 45 kilometres, I think. We'll start the next climb of the day at Oatville, which is actually the little great St. Bernard Pass. And uh, maybe Bernard will have a go again. He's in that front group. <laughs> he may well have a go at being in the front group. It's going to be another difficult climb, not as high as the climb that we've just been over, the Corme de Roselon. It climbs up to 1,639 metres. It's a 15.5-kilometre climb, and it's a fairly steady average grade fill at 4.7%. The steepest part is only 6%. But uh, after the way we've been racing since the start, I think all of these mountains are going to feel very difficult. Well, it's been a lovely day for the cyclo-tourist ride through the Alps today, but not for the Tour de France. I'll be frightened to death. The way these boys are having to conquer the Alps today has been such a great attacking race. The peloton has been under pressure ever since the flag went down today. Here's the peloton now. There's the, si the sort of force of the wind. Cross and tail as they come off the mountain. That's the Belgian flag. Nearly five minutes. They're pulling it back a little bit on the descent. Just a fraction. Uh, I think now people are starting to panic a little bit. They realise there's two more climbs to go, and they probably realise that they've got more chance of getting themselves organised on the next climb of the day, which is a smooth, average gradient climb. Team uh, Lamprey on the front, and they're thinking about their man, Vladik Tadjevic, and I'm not sure that he's a great chance to finish in the overall classification. It's Alessandro Balan doing the majority of the pacemaking on the front. But uh, it really is, I think, Phil, about time for another team to come forward and start setting the pace, although I see in about sixth and seventh position that uh, Cadell Evans had a couple of teammates up alongside him and maybe Cadell is now going to just put his uh, hand onto the table and say right I'm going to take control 
sooner or later decisions have to be made this is a big gap to give Michael Rogers because he rides a great time trial I know he's not as fast as he was which took him once the three world titles in a row because he sacrificed some of his pure speed to learn how to ride the mountains I think today he's showing us he's learned how to ride the mountains because he's up in that leading group and looks very strong alongside arguably the finest climber in the Tour de France Michael Rasmussen well, Michael Rasmussen rode the, that climb uh, superbly. You have to bear in mind that he rode across the gap of one and a half minutes, and that is what I think is quite phenomenal. This is the excitement if you're at the back of the group, and uh, let, bear in mind there is no safety barrier, there's no safety net, especially when you go down some of these mountains. You have to make sure that you actually keep yourself on the road. Yeah, Stefan Goubert there it was a bit of a speed wobble. He doesn't look too confident down this climb. No, he doesn't. Uh, the man leading them down is, uh, it looks as if it's Michael Rasmussen, a two times world champion in the uh, mountain bike discipline, the sport. Goubert, 37 years of age, just backing off Antonio Coloma fraction. And in fact, they're taking, oh, somebody's got off there. Michael Rogers has gone down. Rogers has gone down straight over the top is David Arroyo as well. Arroyo's climbing back up there. This is what can happen on any stage. And Rogers, it looks okay. The problem with Rogers is that as a mechanical with the bike, the bike is absolutely broken. Let's go. We're going round the corner here. Rogers has lost it a fraction. Over the top there, you can see the trees waving. Well, those, I think the first man to go down there was David Arroyo climbing his way back up. As I said, there is no safety net on these descents in the tour. Arroyo looks okay. I think Michael Rogers is okay too. The problem with Rogers is his bike is broken. The mechanic looks at it, picks it up, and he can see the damage there. Arroyo is away. Where's Rogers? Arroyo is up and running. He's riding clear. Well, this is com this is what can happen on any stage. Arroyo now a little bit shaken. You see, once you've gone down like that, you'll be a little bit nerve nervy going into the next corners. You see how he's lost it all completely. He's, he's not got the confidence anymore. It'll take him a few more corners to get back into his rhythm. It really knocks the stuffing out of you when something like this happens. So there we go. Uh, the man who controlled it best going around that corner was Antonio Colón. There are the cars. He, he'll be rejoining the peloton in a moment. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, you've always got to be attentive. You never know when there's going to be danger around any corner. And you look at that corner there. The, there's an incredible drop-off. And fortunately for David Arroyo, he came down there at a point where there were some trees to go into. And he got himself a, a fairly soft landing. This is the next group. This is the second group on the road, I think, because that's Christoph Mavell just sitting on the back there. And there's... Uh, that's Guterres in front of him. Just a little bit of chaos here. I tell you, you've got to be so attentive. The main fielder of the uh, yellow jersey group now at four and a half minutes. So this is the group of George Hincapi. I can't see Hincapi. Hincapi himself is a very good descender. He's an expert at going downhill. And he realises there's Sergio Paolino, so in fact, I presume George Hincapi's gone too. Oh, ...about what goes on on mountains. That was a heavy crash. I think Rogers is OK, and Arroyo trying to get back on. Well, they're going to have to take a few risks, but when you've had an accident like that, you're a little bit windy for a while, and uh, you can see just how technical this descent is because uh, Arroyo and the motorbike of the cameraman here are having a hard time getting back into contact with this race. Riders, in fact, can go down a descent like this faster than a motorbike and faster than a car, and our motorbike cameraman here is having to do an incredible job. In the confusion there, I'm not quite sure how quickly Mick Rogers got up and running, but shortly we'll have to find out and see. He seemed OK, he was hurting, but he seemed OK. I don't think it was a case of any broken bones, anything like that. He got the mechanic straight onto repairing the bike. Arroyo was quick. He must have had a shock when he went down in amongst the trees there, but he seems to be coming back. Hopefully our pictures have locked up again. Here we are now. We're with Michael Rogers now, looking closely at Michael. Sorry about the pictures. That's because we're in the trees and this is out of our control. I think Rogers is OK, but it's a nasty shock. It's a nasty shock to any rider when you go down like that. Uh, and I think the reason Mick Rogers went down was because he was right behind Arroyo and he had to change his line. His problem, the problem with his bike was uh, something was broken on the machine. The mechanic had to run back and get him a spare bike. He lost a little bit of time, but he is up and riding again. Those fast crashes normally are not crashes that end up providing an injury because you're, you're in control, you're alert, and you're waiting for something to happen.
unless you fall down into a ditch like poor old David Arroyo did but he got away with that one it could have been anywhere in the mountain it wasn't too bad just look at the slip off the side there when you make a mistake these are dangerous moments in the Tour de France because these riders want to regain lost time they do take chances and in Rogers and Arroyo's situation they're trying to gain time and that's why they're taking chances well, this is a long, long drop down here in the Tour de France. It is a very dangerous one down the Corme de Roseland. And the big field here is trying now just to get down safely, I think, and then challenge on the next climb coming up. Michael Rogers, who's crashed on the descent, is up and riding now and is trying to rejoin the leaders. He'll be a little bit behind Arroyo as those two riders were looking at the peloton and there is an incredible view of the descent of the Roseland.